The final stretch, I guess, of this class, um, before we start talking about remediation, is to realize that a lot of the things that we've done, we've actually covered a, a decent uh, waterfront, I guess, so far. Uh, we've looked at multi-phase flow. Uh, we've looked at how non-aqueous fluids travel in some subsurface and understood what the properties are that kind of control that behavior. Uh, we've tried to estimate where they might end up, distributed above or below water tables. Um, and from that, tried to work out exactly what their subsequent mobility would be, either by dissolution in the groundwater as a plume, either uh, conservative, conserved in the subsurface where there's no retardation, uh, or uh, not conserved where there is retardation and attenuation of the plume. And also what happens to them if they're trapped in the Vado zone in this uh, uh, chimney that goes down to the water table and what might happen to them there. And so this is all the, the precursors of knowing where they would get to and the mechanisms by which they could be fugitive from there. And those precursors, of course, are useful for you if you want to design methods to be able to pull them out of uh, the subsurface in terms of remediation, which is the final activity that we'll talk about after this. Um, we've tried to talk in a, in a physics-based way of understanding what the processes are by which they get to where they are and by which they can be mobilized in terms of permeabilities, uh, capillary pressures, uh, define those behaviors and saturations, how solubilities contribute to concentrations that get carried downstream, uh, to understand what those physical characteristics are, and to realize that there are certain physical measurements that we'd like to be able to make to be able to define whether they'll stay put, which is what we might like, or if you're trying to remediate a uh, site, you'd actually like them to be able to be moved. And so we need to understand a little bit about how we get this picture of the subsurface, which in all your assignments, we've kind of taken as a given. This is the stratigraphy, this is the permeability, these are the characteristics of the fluids, and uh, with this, figure this out. And so now, uh, we will delve into the fact that we don't necessarily, when you're standing on top of a, uh, a brownfield or a greenfield site, I guess really a brownfield site, uh, you can't necessarily tell exactly what's in the subsurface. And uh, so we have to talk about the ways in which we'll get the data to turn into the information that we need to be able to make good decisions about uh, what's there in the first place, what are the distribution of concentrations? How do we figure that out? What are the distributions of parameters that we need, such as permeability uh, and other parameters we might like to relate to capillary pressures and entry pressures that we need to be able to say something about how um, mobile either the free phase or the dissolved phase might be in the subsurface. And that's what we'll, we'll talk about today. Um, we'll spend some time, a decent amount of time, I think, uh, messing around with some uh, some uh, photos uh, to describe what's going on. Uh, but really, uh, typically, this part of the, the syllabus is divided between two, two components, what we'll call direct investigation methods and uh, indirect investigation methods. And direct is synonymous for drilling, fancier word for drilling, or for direct push methods. And indirect would be geophysics. Geophysics where you measure some parameter remotely on the surface, the density of uh, the rock, and use it as a proxy for rock or soil or different kinds of rocks or soil. The seismic velocity, and use that as a proxy for different kinds of rocks or soils. But by direct, we physically delve into it, drill through it, recover samples, and from either borehole geophysics or from taking the samples back to the lab, we can say, or by doing field tests in the, in the resulting borehole, we can say something about what's present in, in place. So uh, for our intents and purposes today, we'll talk about drilling, what methods we can use. And broadly defined, it matters whether we're drilling shallowly into soil or more deeply into rock as to what we might use. And the methods that we use will be different in each of them. Once we've got a borehole, that isn't necessarily the whole picture because a borehole doesn't really tell us what's there unless we sample the stuff that's in it, either during the act of drilling it by taking drill chips that come up through the, um, uh, the borehole and hit you in the head. Could be your first job that you get 
uh, working on this would not be an, an atypical job would be going into the field taking measurements and doing duty on a drill rig certainly was for me um, so sampling is part of that and also once you've paid a relatively large amount of money to put a, a drill hole into the ground uh, it may be wasted unless you get the maximum benefit from it and the maximum benefit may involve putting some instrumentation in it that might measure something and that instrumentation might often be measurements to, for instance, measure permeabilities in situ by uh, injection experiments. And so these are all methods of, first of all, of drilling, then of sampling in drill holes, leaving some instrumentation to take measurements in drill holes. And the one which is separate from those is something that can only be applied in soil, and that is in situ profiling, basically by pushing a, a rod into the ground measuring how much force you have to apply, measuring the pore pressures that are generated, and using that to say something about what the, the stratigraphy would be. Um, I, I won't go through these slides because they're, they're not so important. But site investigation is a, uh, an involved process. So you go to a site. First of all, you'd like to be able to figure out what might have been written about that site before. So it would be things like uh, U.S. Geological Survey reports on the geology of an, an area. There might be previous uh, reports from other consultants or contractors you can use. There might be photogeology, aerial photography, aerial geology studies of what's going on. And so utilizing any kind of information you can get is useful. From that, you might devise a plan to go in and to try and figure out what's going on. Um, these diagrams, these plan views of the uh, Smithville site uh, if you remember all of these individual dots here, these are all drill holes which are sampled in some way to figure out what the extent of this uh, free phase plume in the subsurface was just by drilling into it like a pin cushion and others outside that as well and also other measurements to be able to measure the aqueous concentration of the plume. So it's not a one-stop decision process. You gather some information, you drill a hole. You see what you get in the hole, you need to decide whether you need another hole. Is it next to the hole that you've drilled already or a long way away? Do you want to do geophysics once you get a couple of drill holes in there to try and join the dots between those holes to say what the stratigraphy is, rather than being able to uh, put down a pin cushion of drill holes, which when you're talking about a site like Smithville, which is only maybe 10 meters deep, 30 feet, you know, the height of a, a two-story house, uh, is relatively inexpensive. But when you have to go down hundreds of feet, then all of a sudden it becomes a different uh, level expenditure. And so you can imagine that in a normal study, there'd be things like gathering initial reports, seeing what they say, uh, looking at photogeology, aerial photogeology, to see what the stratigraphy is at, at large scale, perhaps less uh, related to the kind of small scale field studies that we'd be doing. You might walk the site to see what uh, there is in outcrops. You might see if there are ditches and what is in those ditches. But ultimately, at some stage, you're going to have to propose to do something in terms of a full investigation. And as we've mentioned, that falls into two categories, either indirectly using geophysics or directly using drilling or direct push to be able to really figure out what's going on. And so these two sessions today, we'll see how far we get. Certainly, we'll get partway through talking about direct. Maybe we'll get through or through all of it. And uh, we'll have one session when we'll talk about the relevant geophysical methods that can be applied to um, environmental problems as well, including seismics and GPR. But let's, let's not do that uh, today. So again, hokey diagrams, but they, they serve to make the point. So the difference between geophysics, which is an indirect method, which is always a bit subjective because you're not really sampling directly, but you're inferring behavior from some geophysical measurement. The benefits of geophysics is you cover the complete volume of your site, but you don't know exactly what's there. The advantage of drilling is that you have a very good idea of what happens exactly along this one, whoops, this one dimensional traverse along your site, but nothing much outside that. And so they're complementary in some way to each other. This is fantastic data along this one trajectory, but nothing outside. Geophysics gives you 
great data over the whole thing, but it doesn't really say exactly what it is, and it certainly doesn't tell you what the permeability is. It might tell you it's a, a rock versus a soil, it might tell you it's a sand versus a clay, but nothing in terms of properties. So they, they provide different pieces of information. So in ten, terms of direct uh, investigation, you could imagine that you can either have a 1D look at your site through a borehole, you could have a 2D slice across your site by bringing a backhoe in at $60 an hour, digging a trench, which might go down 10 feet, which you could log to see what's there. Or you could have a 3D view of your site through geophysics. And so that's really what we're, we're talking about. So in the first part of that, to talk about um, uh, drilling or sampling using drill holes, it matters between whether you're talking about shallow investigation which sometimes, it, well, usually is in soil or maybe weathered bedrock, or if you're doing deeper, pen, deeper uh, investigation in rock. And the techniques that you would use would depend on those. And so broadly defined, um, we can think of three different techniques in order, and we'll look at them in more detail. And going from soil only, soil and rock, and rock only. And they are in order augering, direct flush drilling, and diamond coring. And so uh, just talk very briefly about each of them before we talk maybe in, in perhaps better detail. Augering is just like taking a corkscrew uh, and screwing that corkscrew into the ground. Except as you screw the corkscrew into the ground, it's not going at the same rate as the flukes want to uh, advance. It's going slower than that. And as a result, on these flukes, the material which is in the borehole wall gets physically sent up to the surface, and you can sample it. Uh, you can either have a solid stem auger, where you sample from the surface and you get clay. You presume there's clay some distance below at the tip. Or you can use a hollow stem auger, where you have a central uh, plug at the tip of this shoe, that stops any soil going up inside this as you screw it into the ground. And then when you get down to the depth where you want to sample, you pull out this uh, A-rod, you open up the, the base, and you can sample through the base by, by sampling it through some method. And so they come in two different varieties. Only can be used in uh, soils, because you can imagine trying to push this through rock. Not going to happen. Um, and it has the advantage that maybe you can go down um, 20 feet an hour, probably faster than that actually, in just soils, if you're not sampling, very fast. Uh, not very accurate if it's a solid stem because you don't really know what's right at the tip. Somewhat more accurate if it's a hollow stem because you can sample through the tip. And the advantage always is that you keep the borehole open because you're basically driving or screwing, if you like, a casing into the ground which doesn't allow it to collapse. So I think those are the things that are mentioned there. If you're looking at going through soil and keeping on going into rock, or going through rock, uh, and again not wanting samples, then typically the way is by um, rotary um, uh, tricone drilling. And tricone drilling is, well, it's a horrible diagram, but we look at some real pictures of these things, is you push this thing into the ground, um, it rotates, but it has some crushing teeth at the base, which break off piece of the well bore. You circulate water or air or foam down through the center, and it returns uh, water or air or foam on the outside, but it also picks up the drilling chips that get sent up to the top as well. Um, it drills a cylindrical cavity, uh, which isn't cased, and therefore, as a result of that, can collapse. And also, it doesn't really take samples. It just destroys what's ahead of it in the borehole as it crushes its way down and goes through here. So they usually use tricone bits, um, often use water, but sometimes in shallow holes uses air or foam. Uh, if it uses water, sometimes mud is added to give extra weight to stop the borehole collapsing if it's a soil. Uh, can equally go equally well go through soil and rock. It uh, doesn't give you any samples, but if you want to take a sample from the base, then you have to pull all the drill string out and then go back in, take a sample, and then put the drill string back. So it's a very slow process to do that. 
And so you may choose not to take samples and only use the drill cuttings to figure out what's going on, uh, which you typically do. And if you want to be able to take samples, uh, then you have to, to do something else. And finally, so the, the in rock only, actually you can go through soil with this, uh, but primarily in rock, then uh, diamond drilling or rotary drilling is the uh, typical choice. It's always the choice for things like ore bodies, where you want a really high quality sample that includes the gold and the diamonds in it that's archival. And the idea that instead of beating up the bottom of the hole, which is what a rotary drill does, it's really just like a cookie cutter. And a cookie cutter that keeps on turning is studded with diamond bits, uh, diamond chips really, at the tip of this um, cylindrical rod. So this is a shoe at the bottom of a cylindrical rod. It's physically turned and pushed into the ground, so it abrades its way progressively into the rock. And as it abrades its way progressively into the rock, then progressively in the central core barrel, um, the cookie rises. So you get this stock of core that rises here. And again, you flush water down to cool the bit and to, to um, eject the drill cuttings from the tip, which are typically just flour, powder. It's not chips that are broken off, but it's, it's uh, rock that's worn away just by rubbing uh, diamonds, sandpaper, if you like, on, on the surface of this. And it has the best quality samples because it has a continuous, potentially, sample of the rock that you're going through. And you can take it back to the lab to do all kinds of things. Uh, much slower than tricone drilling, maybe by a factor of three, four, depending on the rock you're going through, but an absolutely magnificent quality sample that leaves you in not very much doubt as to really what's in place uh, in the subsurface. So those are kind of the, the, the methods that are, are used for, for doing that. So some better pictures maybe to, to kind of illustrate those points. Um, these are in your notes. I won't go through the stuff on the, the left-hand side. I guess I'll talk about that as we go through this. But these are the, the techniques that we're talking about. Um, oh, many years ago, we had a kid, in, kid, a young adult in this class, one of your contemporaries, whose father used to be a driller. He used to be a cable tool driller. So this is the same techniques that used to be used for the Drake well in Pennsylvania in the uh, late 1800s, I guess. You drop a weight down a hole, it pulverizes the stuff at the bottom, uh, and then the pulverized stuff you bail out of the hole, complete with cuttings to the surface, and then you keep on keep on going through. So barely used now, but it has been used. Rotary drilling is this method where you uh, break up the base of the hole by just having a tricone bit, which smashes the base of the hole to pieces, and then flushes up the drill chips, maybe the size of the tip of your finger, up to the top of the hole. Uh, and therefore makes an advance along here. And augering being in soils only, where you drive this flighted auger into the, into the hole, in, in soil only. So augers come in two varieties. Um, solid stems are where you have, not surprisingly, a one-inch diameter-ish A-rod, which has flights welded onto it. It has a cutting shoe at the base, and you add typically five feet sections of this A-rod and auger as you get deeper and deeper, screws itself into the ground. The material gets removed from the hole. It travels up here on the flights, and you can sample it from the surface. But you're never quite sure from what depth it comes, uh, even though you measure how deep you are and the number of rods that you have and how far the junction between the next rod is up from the ground. You're never quite sure where the material f that comes onto the surface, what depth it's coming from. And so to take a sample, what you do is you pull a string. If you pull a string, it leaves an open hole. There's no water in the hole except for the ground water, which might come in from the stuff around. And you put a sampling tool, which is typically uh, either a what's called a split spoon, um, a cylindrical sample that splits into two halves but has a drill, a shoe on the, the bottom and a shoe on the top that fits onto rod which is placed down the hole. 
and it's initially placed on the bottom of the hole and physically banged into the ground with a, a monkey hammer, which we'll see later, which is not, not a very sophisticated component. So it takes a sample, like a cookie cutter, and then this is brought back to the surface, and then you reintroduce the, the solid stem auger into the hole and keep on going until the next place where you want to take a sample, and you repeat. These samples would be disturbed samples if it's in sands, or intact samples if it's in clays, where the, the shoe that you use is a much thinner walled sample and, and therefore much less disturbed. But these would go back to the lab for whatever experiments you want to, to do with them. The problem with this, of course, is if you're in materials which are um, friable, such as sands with not very much cohesion, when you go down through it with the hollow stem and then you pull it out, then if they're permeable, what they'll tend to do is the water that then flows into this hole will drag stuff with it. And so the stuff that it drags with it won't then be in the sides of the hole, but will slough into the bottom of the hole. And so now when you go in and sample, the sample that you take, the top part of this sample will be this lousy stuff which is in the hole, which you would interpret if you looked at this, that you're right here at a junction between two materials, sand above, and I guess silty sand below. And that's clearly not the case. And so uh, the disadvantage is that you might lose the hole completely because this might completely cave in and fill the hole up to this portion here, in which case you'd, you'd know that that would happen because you'd be sampling here. But if you've gone down to this depth here and it's just partly filled maybe six inches or a foot above it, then you wouldn't really suspect the fact that the stuff at the top of your sample, unless you're very careful in measuring this, is really a, a spurious material that shouldn't be there. And so one way to get around that is to use a hollow stem auger. And a hollow stem auger is exactly as it word suggests. The idea is that it's um, a cylinder, an open cylinder, with flights attached to it. These are the auger flights. Inside this open cylinder, there's a piece of A-rod, which is in the same number of sections as the external pipe, typically five feet long. But at the tip of this, where it's open, this A-rod has a cutting shoe, which is almost you know, like my fingers, which is turned at the base, and also has a cutting shoe, which is attached to the main cylindrical thing with flights on it. This, th these both rotate in unison, until you get down to the depth where you want to be. Once you're at the depth you want to be, you pull this A-rod out through the hole, and you're left with a hollow stem auger, which is really a casing, which is holding your hole open. It doesn't allow this stuff to fall in. And now when you advance your, your sampling tool down through the interior of this and take a sample, de facto, you know that there's nothing that's sloughed onto the surface and therefore will mess up your interpretation of exactly what's there. You don't have to pull a drill string to do it, so it's faster. And so I guess in all many respects, it's a win-win on both sides. It's faster because you don't have to pull a drill string, and it's more um, likely that the samples that you get from the bottom will be successful because the, the hole won't cave, and also that the samples that you take will actually be representative of what is there. And so Solid stem and uh, hollow stem and solid stem augering are the, are the techniques, if you like, for soil alone and can't be used for, for rock. Hollow stems allow you to sample without pulling a drill string. Solid stems do not and have the problems of collapse. If you want to drill through soil and or rock, clearly augering won't go through rock, but uh, rotary drilling will, then the techniques are rather similar. A rotary drill typically is on a drill string with a tricone bit. So these three cones at the tip of a bit are put together. It's rotated at the, the top and roll, these uh, tricones roll around at the base of the hole. They don't, they're not actively powered, but they provide a very large force from the drill stem on a very small area. They chip off little flakes of rock which gets uh, washed back to the top surface by the drill fluid, which is circulated down the center of the drill string, 
around the bottom of the hole and then up through in the annulus to uh, the surface and goes into a big tub on the surface. If you want to take a sample in soils, which you can do, then you pull a drill string. It leaves your open hole with the drilling mud in it. Uh, the drill mud is just a suspension of clays that gives an extra weight to the hole, so it presses a larger stress against the borehole wall and keeps it open, stops it from collapsing. And then you advance the same uh, split spoon or Shelby tube tool down to the bottom and physically bang it into the, to the base of the, the hole, take a sample back to the top, and then resume drilling. And so, again, it has the same... Uh, desirable qualities as before, it's quite fast, but when you pull out the drill string, again you have this possibility that if you're, if you're not using water or if your mud weights aren't high enough, it'll allow stuff on the side to slough in and you have exactly the same spurious uh, sampling problem that you had in uh, the, uh, the solid stem augers. And so, although rotary drilling is fast because you don't continuously take a sample as you go down. Uh, it's slowed by the fact that you have to pull a drill string to be able to make a sample and that if you are doing that you have this problem of getting an incorrect sample when you go down. And if you don't want a sample you do have a, certainly in rocks, you have the potential to take drill cuttings out of the bottom just by washing the drill fluid through a, a household uh, sieve, you know, one that you'd use for cooking, uh, and be able to see whether it's a sandstone or a limestone or whatever. It doesn't tell you anything about the structure because it's completely broken, uh, such as the fracture spacing or whether there are fractures there, but at least it tells you something about what you're going through. So rotary drilling can be used in soil or rock, and to some extent diamond drilling can be as well, but typically diamond drilling is used for, for rock. Uh, you can go through hard clays uh, with diamond drilling, but typically you don't. You auger your way through them to get down to bedrock, and then you put in casing, and then you'd start diamond drilling from, from that depth. And so as we, we showed before, maybe not in such a great figure, the idea is that you have a true tube. This tube has a shoe attached to the base of it. This shoe is studded with industrial diamonds all the way around. These diamonds, as this thing is uh, rotated, uh, bite into the rock and abrade the material here. Drilling fluid is circulated down, can be water, can be air if you want to preserve the, can be nitrogen if you really want to preserve it with an inert gas, what's going on in some really high cost drilling cases. Uh, sometimes it's drill mud to keep the hole open. And this both cools off the bit and circulates the drill flour, because it really is just a powder, back to the surface, where there's no point sampling it because it's a flour, just a milky solution. <laughs> but the sample is the core, the cylindrical core, that advances its way up through the tube. Um, and depending on how fancy you want to get, the core barrels can be either what's called uh, single tube core barrels, where you have um, the fluid in contact with the core, as it gets washed down through here and therefore contaminates the core potentially because it's in contact as before it goes back up. Or the core is inside an interior core barrel, which we'll look at. And so as the drilling fluid uh, is washed down through here, it's actually physically separated from the core except for exactly at the tip where it contacts slightly and washes up. And so this uh, core is actually now ensconced in terms of a, um, a steel or sometimes a, a plastic polyethylene core barrel, which keeps it both intact, keeps it separate away from the drilling fluids, but more importantly, uh, that you can't see here, is often attached to the surface by a wire line. And so as you drill with the drill string, this acts as your uh, casing. The borehole can't collapse on it because the borehole wall is right here and really can't move in any further even though there's a thin layer of water here. So the borehole, um, the rotary drill string is the, basically the casing as you go down so it can't collapse. 
And so now when you sample, you can retrieve the samples up through the drill string, uh, put down a new core barrel, and then drilling again without any interruption in the drilling process. So you get really high quality samples. Those high quality samples can be kept separate from contamination by drill fluids. You don't have to drill uh, to pull all the drill string to be able to make a sample. You just have to uh, pull this central tube. Uh, those are all advantages and you get a continuous sample with the length of it. The disadvantage is that because you're basically abrading it, like sandpapering it to, to advance through it, then the rate of advance is slow. You might go a foot an hour, three feet an hour maybe, something like that. And so to get any decent distance down through there, it takes a long time. I'm sorry, maybe you had mentioned this, but what exactly is in the drilling sort of, Is it mostly water? Do you have lubricants? You can choose whatever you want, and you'd like to choose whatever you can get away with. So it's much easier to drill with air, because air is everywhere available. You just suck it in. But air doesn't provide much of a, uh, a, a lateral pressure to keep the hole from caving if it's prone to do that. And so if you need to keep the well bore open, uh, then you'd use water. But then, then the next thing would be to add some water to the air and make a foam. And the foam wouldn't provide much support to keep the well bore open, but the bubbles in the foam would provide enough um, up borehole drag on the particles to get them to the top so they wouldn't accumulate at the bottom and clog the borehole. So it primarily just pull stuff out of the system. And if it was that the borehole was going to collapse, then you'd want to use water that would be a pressure that, in trying to seep, uh, seep out against this, it provides a body force. And the, the body force is actually equal to, you can look at the units of the change of pressure with length. The units of this are pressure. Uh, pressure with length are force over, I'm doing more than I need to do here, don't I? fourth over uh, per area. This is per length, so this is force per unit volume. So a body force due to seepage actually keeps the walls on. And you can imagine, right, if you have a force acting against it, it's stopping it from collapsing. So water will provide that force, uh, which would be the same as the, the hydrostat. But if you add a more dense fluid by adding typically bentonite, which is what drilling mud is, it'll make that hydrostat larger because it's denser than water and so it provides a larger push to keep the borehole open that's it so those are the reasons so to keep it open and not collapsing and also to make sure that you get the, the drill cuttings to the, the surface okay. and so yeah and so those are the methods um, a summary of different methods there and I won't go through that uh, we've kind of talked about what the advantages and disadvantages are I'll let you go through that um, when these can be used, we've talked about that as well, So, and rough costs of these things, so I'll let you go through that. Uh, but uh, let's look at some photos, because uh, I think it uh, will bring these things to make sense. Let's see how these work out. All right. So, uh, 183 photos. I guess we're going to look at photos for the rest of the class. Um, we're talking about drilling, and we're talking about specific types of drilling. We're not talking about every kind of drilling. I guess we're talking about um, environmental site investigation. So we're not talking about oil well drilling to uh, 3,000 meters from Marcellus. We're not talking about mine drill hole uh, and uh, blast hole drilling, which is specialized. So some of the drilling that we're talking about that we're really not talking about is this. These are air track drills. They're used in mines. This is a, a mine in the, uh, the foothills of the Canadian Rockies near west of Edmonton, uh, near Jasper National Park. This probably is Jasper in the, in the background. Uh, these are air tracks. So all it is is a compressor, a, a drill steel, and the compressor provides a uh, compressed air as a pulse. That pulse is fed into the drill, just like a jackhammer in the, to dig up the street, and it pulses it, it punches the, the drill into the base of the drill hole, and 
both the motive force for the drill moving up and down is provided by the compressed air cycling, and also the flushing of the drill chips that are broken at the base of the drill hole are also flushed back through the hole by the same fluid. Always air, hence the term air track. Maybe you'll go down 20 feet by adding <coughs> different drill strings to this. No samples taken. Almost always the reason for this is to drill holes that you'll fill up with uh, explosive, ANFO, ammonium nitrate with fuel oil mixed, so uh, fertilizer and uh, uh, diesel oil, which is then ignited to blast uh, benches in open, open cast mines. They drill holes, so you could use them. Uh, you could take the, the drills that are sampled for them, but those aren't expiration uh, drill rigs. A drill rig near Rocky Mountain House, also in uh, western Alberta, uh, which is a petroleum rig um, for drilling thousands of feet down uh, with huge motors, is driven to site on the back of you know five semis, uh, semis, and then set up. Again, this is not the drilling we're talking about, although the techniques are, are, are rather similar. I think this is Los Alamos in uh, New Mexico. And heavy-duty uh, blast hole holes. So these are blast hole rigs. You can see the, um, the towers. You can't really see the active part of it. But these move around on um, uh, caterpillar tracks. They just pump their way down uh, 30 feet into the subsurface, drill maybe 9-inch diameter holes, which are filled with explosive, and then bench blasted. This is actually a coal mine, again, in the front ranges of uh, the Canadian Rockies. I think of, uh, at Cardinal Rivers, uh, Cardinal River coal mines, I think, in, in Western Canada. So we're not talking about that either. And we're not talking about it, this either. This actually is, isn't a drill rig. This is Norman Wells, just south of the Arctic Circle um, in Northwest Territories, uh, Canada, on the Mackenzie River. And this is a rig which is just a... Um, a derrick, a borehole, uh, a crane derrick to use to introduce tools down uh, an existing petroleum well to clean it out and to rehabilitate it in winter time. Of course. And that's not well. Yeah. Water could be drilling water. Yeah, I guess I see if I can make these larger because I want to make these were taken with a very uh, low resolution, probably 200 by. 300 pixel camera in 19, no, 2002. And so these are photos of a diamond drill rig in the Caribbean. I guess you perhaps can't see that at all. You might as well turn the lights off, <coughs> maybe completely. And uh, this is on the island of Montserrat with a, a then active erupting volcano. Um, and so you can see a turntable here that's linked into this. So the turntable goes round. This is the drill steel that goes into the ground. Uh, and this is set up with the top of the, um, the drill steel with a screw-in connection and with a, a winch to be able to pull this. And so uh, this is getting ready to pull the drill steel. So in other words, you clamp it here. You attach to the uh, screw connection at the top of the, um, the drill steel a screw-in connection. You release the clamps, which are on this, and you pull this thing into the mast. And then you clamp it at the bottom. You break the drill steel. You lower it down into the pile of uh, drill steel you have. And then you repeat for all the other components in the well. So it's relatively straightforward technique. No different. So the controls, driller stands here. These controls control whether it goes up or down the mast as it's drilling, whether it's going slowly in forward motion or reverse motion. I guess always in forward motion. If it goes in reverse, it'll unscrew itself in the hole, and you don't want to do that. Uh, the drill steel going into casing. So the casing goes down through the soil and interfaces with the rock and then stops. And so that allows you to put the drill steel all the way through the casing directly into the rock, which you know presumably won't collapse on you as you try to drill through this. 
this all messed up stuff here are the drill cuttings that have come back through this gap between the drill steel and the casing and just overflown onto the surface. Uh, a pallet to stand on when you're dealing with these things. And the business end of the, um, the drill bit. So this is the drill steel. This is the shoe. These uh, are, if you can't see it very well, this is studded with industrial diamonds here and on the tip. These grooves are to allow water, which comes down through the central part of this, which would ultimately include the core as well, right? To flush down through here, to go along these uh, grooves, and to recirculate back up to uh, the surface. This is uh, another a reaming, um, a reamer, if you like. And so here is also industrial diamonds so that as you drill the hole and the hole tries to squeeze back in on you, this makes sure that it kind of overreams the hole so that it remains open even as you're drilling down. So this is just to try and keep the, the hole open. So this is probably a 20-foot piece of drill steel, which is one length, which is then added on to another 20 feet, and then another 20 feet, and another 20 feet, which is pushed into the ground. We made the case before, I'll come back to those, that inside this drilling shoe, we don't want to pull the drill pipe every time we want to take a sample. So what we would like to do is to have something that would go down inside this, which would be uh, an interior core barrel, which we can pull up through the drill string. And so this core barrel obviously has to be smaller diameter than the drill steel itself. And looks like this. Um, so it's the full length of the drill pipe that's used, actually a bit longer by the looks of it. It's narrow diameter. The core goes up inside this, and this is physically lowered down all the way through the interior of the drill string so that this tip here ends up right at the drill shoe, right behind it. And is just an open cylinder except for this coupling at the top. And the coupling at the top, well this is the bottom, this is the part that goes through the shoe. Water would come down on the outside of this, the core would be inside the inside, it would be protected away from this water which you don't want to contaminate it, and I guess these holes must be to get the water directly to the shoe, down through the base of the shoe, and then back up on the outside to get to the surface. And then when we want to be able to sample this drill string, what we do is we look at the top of the drill string. You can't see it so well here. Actually, these, uh, these are, um, this is the top of the drill string. You can see that maybe with a bit of imagination, that it's gimbaled so that one can rotate relative to the other. And I don't know whether you can see this or not. This is a little cone at the top. See if I've got a, you know, I have a closer picture. This little cone here will obviously sit upright in the drill string. And what you have is a fishing tool that you send down inside the, the drill string, and it clicks onto this uh, cone. And in clicking onto this cone, it disconnects a connection here that separates this whole assembly from the inside of the drill string, and you pull it up through the thing on a wire cable. That's all. Hence, wire line sampling. And so the fishing tool that attaches onto that is this. You can see here that this is just a, almost yeah, a female coupling, I suppose, that has a little spring-loaded clamp on here that would have two little fingers that go in, and they're on spring steel. The fingers clamp onto the top of the cone as soon as it goes over it with the weight of the wire line. It engages that cone and then it releases it from the drill string and then it physically gets pulled up through the rest of the, uh, the assemblage up to the surface. And so that's it. Uh, the drilling tube has these individual uh, regular right hand connections. You always drill uh, clockwise. If you drill counterclockwise, you'll separate the drill string 
in the hole, which of course would probably get you fired, could potentially get you fired if you wanted a driller to do that. Yeah, you can see there quite well, right? This is just the, the connector that goes onto this fishing tool. And if you're not drilling with air, the disadvantage of not drilling with air is that you physically have to get water to the site, either in a water truck or pipe it from somewhere close to the ocean, but you'd almost never use ocean water. This is the Caribbean. Uh, and that can be a real impediment. At this particular job, it was impossible to get water because the people working here worked on Caribbean time and you just couldn't schedule anything. It just was impossible to get anything done. But this is a, a mud tank, mixing mud, uh, mixing water with bentonite to be able to keep the, the well open. And it turned very difficult to keep the well open. Uh, this is the drill mast, uh, which allows the drill rod to be hoisted up into the mast. And this is the turntable, which provides the motive power to it to be pushed into the ground. Uh, not all the slides are at this resolution. I guess that's another picture, a scenic picture. Trance Bay is the name of the place. And this is the rig that's get after it's been torn down. So it was a relatively hefty behemoth, which did all of these fancy drilling things, but actually it's a, a transportable entity and actually was shipped down to this location in a bunch of 20-foot shipping containers, you know, the kinds that you see on the backs of trucks that get transported across the ocean. So it was transported in, a, in shipping containers. The mast, aluminum mast, in this case, quite a, it's actually a very fancy drill rig, an unusually fancy drill rig, a research drill rig. This is the turntable laid down after drilling. It's all done by power takeoff, either hydraulics or pneumatics off a, uh, a compressor. And so everything runs off this, uh, existing on a, on a sled in this particular case, which is part of it. Drillers in action. This looks like casing that's being uh, drilled into the ground in the initial stages. Uh, the, the, the return fluid in the drill hole, which is recirculating back to the surface as it's initially drilled. This hole, it's a very unusual for environmental uh, investigations to run 24 hours a day, but this drilling project did run 24 hours a day, so this is nighttime. These hexagonal components here are the drill string, which comes uh, in that form. And in this case, actually, the drill string ended up being the casing that was left in place. And so the, this was drill string slash casing. Okay, now big ones. All right, better. So that was all rotary diamond drilling for, uh, for a, um, a drilling project which was drilling four 200 meter deep holes around a volcano which had seismometers, strain meters, tilt meters put in underground. And the reason for being put underground is that the uh, signal of the erupting volcano that was measured in those, which was quite weak, the signal to noise ratio was high because it was uh, sequestered from noise on the ground. The deeper you go on the ground, the quieter it gets and the signals that you measure might come from the ground, which was what we were trying to measure. It turned out that those four holes of 200 meters uh, in 2002 dollars cost $800,000. So $1,000 per meter to drill that hole. It's incredibly expensive, unusually expensive. But normal drill costs might be of the order of $100 plus dollars per meter or you know, many tens of dollars per feet, maybe $50 per foot, $150 a meter. And so it's not an inexpensive proposition. And so it merely underscores the case that when you drill, you might like to sample to get the, most for the, the bang for the buck for your hole. And you might like to do some tests in it to get the most for it. And you might like to leave some instrumentation there to measure things over time because you've paid this uh, big outlay of money to be able to, to, to dr drill it in the first place. This is a diamond drill. Uh, site in Sweden, near Forsmark, which is where they have a number of nuclear reactors and will be the site for their low-level radioactive waste disposal repository. This is the mast, which is drilling an inclined hole. Uh, this is the engine for the site, for the drill rig. This is just a canopy to protect the drillers from weather. Uh, 
Um, uh, perhaps you can't see so well. This is looking 90 degrees on. In, this is the drill mast uh, along which the, the drilling uh, table ro is lowered and uh, up and down and rotates. It's a bit dark, but you can see that this is this same kind of round thing that would have the drill string go through it and would be powered by power takeoff and hydraulics to rotate. And this would be the drill steel pushing into the ground here and above this. And physically, there'd be a force pushing it down this inclined gantry. So the table would be pushed down here at the same time it's rotated so that this rotary bit can physically grind its way into the ground and leave this uh, string of core to come up uh, in the annulus. Uh, this is a core shack with core. These are the wireline uh, sampling um, tubes that have been recovered from the, uh, the drill string. I didn't say before, but you see there are two tubes here. There are four, I think, in the other case. The reason you want at least more than one is that you pull one drill string with the wire line. Once it's on the surface, you drop down a fresh one, and then you start re-drilling again. And in the meantime, as you're drilling, which doesn't really take much effort, you can get the core out of the other redund the redundant or superfluous uh, wire line, which is then on the surface for you to do that. And typically, the distribution of labor is that the, the driller and the driller's helper do the drilling. And you, on the surface, might be the guy or gal who's hitting the drill tube to get the core out to be able to log it and sample it. And so logging it means it goes into typically um, core boxes, of which these are a whole number of them. An unusually well-organized um, arrangement, maybe one because it's Swedish, and they tend to be that way. Any Swedes here? Uh, and secondly, because it's kind of a high-impact project with a lot lying on it, nuclear waste disposal, even though it's uh, low-level radioactive waste. So low-level radioactive waste typically means irradiated products like uh, medical things that have been used in hospitals, etc., not the actual fuel, but a beautiful facility. This is a um, diamond drill rig. Yeah, we'll take our time going through this. We've got lots of time. We'll spend it out into a couple of uh, deals. This is a diamond drill rig. This is in Norman Wells Northwest Territories, uh, right slightly below the Arctic Circle on Mackenzie River. This is a sled which has a platform on it, which is pulled by these two things here, dragged into location, that's had a... Um, a shed built above it called Mukluk Annie. Anyone know what a Mukluk is? We've looked at this before. Right? Didn't we ask you that question before in this class? Do you remember? They're like, boots. yeah, these over, over boots that uh, keep the snow out. These kind of white, you could imagine mountain, uh, the, the mountain division running around in these white uh, over boots in, through, through snow. Uh, this is Rob Connors, a guy who worked as a driller. He's probably then your age now. Worked as a driller in the wintertime and uh, guiding horse. Um, used to pack horses through the Rockies and take tourists through the Rockies, Canadian Rockies in the summertime. Um, this you can see, maybe, is a uh, the top of the casing, which goes through the river ice, which this is sitting in, through the river, through the river bed, and into rock below it. And then through this is the drill string. This connector here is a connector that allows water, the drilling fluid, to go into it, down the pipe, down to the bottom of the hole, and then to recirculate back up and then waste away on the outside of the casing. This is the power takeoff that provides hydraulic fluid to turn this thing. The only thing that's turning is this drill string here uh, above this turnbuckle and below this turnbuckle with this staying static, obviously. Otherwise, the, the supply water cable would go through, uh, would turn around and twist up. Water is supplied along here from a pump. It happens to be supplied from a steam plant at this site because it's a, an active oil field with an oil refinery there. Uh, and so it's not frozen when it's minus 40 degrees outside in February in 
close to the Arctic Circle. And up here, though you can't see it, is a tower, which um, this thing moves up and down. Actually, you can see the tower. It moves up and down along this tower. Uh, this is the pulley, where you can do it with a very small winch to be able to pull the this up into the, the apex here, and also to raise the drill, drill steel as you, as you go through this. Uh, air, hot air to keep the site warm, just from a heater. A tiger torch to unfreeze frozen drill pipe. A fire extinguisher in case you catch fire, because you're drilling through a very shallow petroleum reservoir. The same rig uh, set up, driller, driller's helper, different tasks. Here, this is a solid stem auger. Starting off a hole, going down through the ground. Here, not on the river, but on, actually it's permafrost, which is next door to it. Just physically screwed into the ground um, in the same way that we, you could imagine to actually begin the hole. And you can see the arrangement. This, this, these are the skids. And all the back end of this here is, is the, the motor of this drill rig. And it's actually a drill rig which is designed to be slung under helicopter to take into the field, not in this particular case, where the field season in the north is the winter because it's frozen. And if you set up to drill in the, the summer, you can get in there by helicopter just as easily, but it sinks through the, through the, uh, the non-frozen permafrost at the surface. And so the, uh, the drill season is uh, invariably in the, um, in the wintertime. And in this case, the only way to get into this particular site in Norman Wells in the wintertime, there's no ground transportation, even though there is a, an ice bridge from the north, to get into town from the south is to fly this in. And so it's flown in in 737s, exactly the same size plane as the A320 that you know, crashed. Um, bizarrely, uh, two, two or three days ago in the Alps, that is divided half and half. Front half for passengers, rear half for cargo, and this goes in there with uh, the fluids all drained. So n no fluids in it. Goes in with pallets of drill rod. So this is solid stem auger, uh, hexagonal couplings so that you put them together in terms of coupling with a a bolt between them to lock them in place. Uh, this is a bit like a hollow stem auger, but it's not. This is what it is called a Krell barrel, Cold Regions Research Labs barrel, which is a, a research lab in, Dar in Hanover, New Hampshire, which uh, developed these uh, for drilling into permafrost. They're stainless steel, cost thousands of dollars each, and have um, very sharp feet on them that allow you to cut and sample permafrost. And don't know what, why it's not advancing. Doesn't want to. It's hung for some reason. Don't think we've reached the end. It's just thinking. Not sure why I did that. We'll see if it keeps on going. Yeah, okay. All right, so that's fine. So anyway, that's uh, a different site. So this is now somewhere on the outskirts of Boston. A drill rig um, that's now truck mounted. This is a cased hole with actually an instrument inside it, which is what this drill hole was for. It was to test out a probe that would be um, advanced during offshore drilling, research drilling in petroleum reservoirs, in Gulf of Mexico deposits where you push it beyond the end of the borehole to be able to in situ sample the pressures to measure the pressures in situ without waiting for the pressures in the borehole to equilibrate. And so it was a research borehole. And so this is a typical rig. It's actually done in an underpass. This is the same drill string that goes up a mast. This is the turntable that turns the system. Um, and this is on top of a hole already in place. The driller's controls, where the driller's helper would work to, to feed on um, drill string to this. We talked about a monkey hammer before as the mechanism that you advance these drilling holes down, to, drilling tools down to the bottom of the hole and then physically bang it in to sample it. 
That's exactly what this is. It's just raised up in the mast and other, other accoutrements. So this is the turntable here. This is drill string. This is the hydraulics to be able to raise or lower this whole thing in the mast. Uh, it turns, and as you turn, you have the weight of the drill rig to also push it down into the ground and to uh, per provide some purchase on the bottom of the, the borehole. There is a uh, drill pipe, which is casing here, which comes back to the surface. And so the return fluids that you pump down here will come back up through this uh, casing and then either spill onto the ground or if you want to reuse them, they'll spill into a tank which you can then suck the fluid back out of and reintroduce it back into here. So it comes into here, it gets pulled out of here along this um, pipe and then it gets reintroduced into the drill string, pumped down the borehole and then goes down and then re-emerges like this. So it's somewhat of a cold closed loop system unless you're losing a lot of fluid into the formation which you prefer not to do because you don't want to have to bring trucks and trucks full of drill fluid to be able to do this. Uh, you can see it's dirty. I don't know in this case whether that's just water. It may be that there's some uh, mud mixed in there to provide an extra weight. Um, this fitting here is just a three a try fitting like on regular plumbing, right, in your house, in your septic system. So septic system would come out to the septic tank or to the to the curb. It would have a clean out that would go up to the surface. It's just one of those regular four-inch diameter pipes. So yes, so water down, uh, water being sucked out of here, going down through the drill pipe, going all the way down to the bottom of the hole, return fluid flushing into here and getting reintroduced. Uh, it's turned by the motion of this. You can see that this is a universal joint that has some give in it, so it can turn it. Uh, this doesn't turn because it's attached to the return fluid line, but this turns and this turns. Uh, you can see that there's a clamp that can be placed on this to lock it in place to be able to change uh, drill steel. That's exactly what they're doing here. Um, They've got the wrench on here to hold it static. They're turning this to be able to tighten the, the threads to be able to lock it in place. And once it's locked in place, what you could do is you could you start drilling with it. You drill all the way down until it's just proud of where it can't go any further. Then you break this connection. And then you, uh, you raise, you attach another piece of drill steel to this raise it up into the top of the mast so it's dangling there you couple the bottom of that drill steel onto the empty coupling here screw it in and then just merrily keep on going on. So it's not particularly it's pretty straightforward in what's going on. This is in December it was cold. Uh, the auger flights I think these are hollow stem auger flights which are also used on here in addition to the rotary drilling which you saw here changing out pipe. This is a winch, just a capstan. So you put the, a rope around three turns. If you pull a bit of pressure on the rope, it tightens around the capstan and the capstan drags it up, anything you attach to it, up into the uh, uh, into the superstructure of the mast, including uh, this rope which has a hammer on it. And this hammer is used for the sampling. And we'll talk about that a bit later. look like um, hollow stem augers. In fact, I think they are hollow stem, right? This is definitely a hollow stem auger. These are the cutting bits that are on the auger. You'd have an insert that goes down to the, the cutting shoe that blocks it to stop stuff going up inside it as you drill it into the ground. Um, this may be that insert. I can't retell. Really what seems strange to me, as I looked at these before, is that this connection is certainly hollow, and you can imagine that these couple with the next one down. They're probably five foot lengths. They couple to the next one. But usually they're, um, they're threaded. So that you screw them together. And since they're threaded, then you can keep an annulus that goes between these. But this has a coupling that, which is a, um, a clip. 
And so I can presume that this is a clip, but it's a clip that certainly doesn't go all the way across here, because if this is a hollow stem, then to be able to keep something at the tip of this that blocks it, this also has to be connected all the way up to the surface. And so if it's connected up to the surface with a rod, then it has to go through this coupling, and so the, the clip coupling can't go across the, the full length here. This is drill pipe below here. This is drill pipe. Uh, always tapered thread so that you can drive them in, and only at the last turn does it lock together. You may have noticed the very first thread in the Caribbean stuff was really not tapered. It was kind of parallel thread. And that's because it was casing that was used as drill pipe, and the drill pipe was actually then left in as casing. And so it was drilled with basically casing. But this is the central annulus. Um, so these conical ones, you would open up with a, a female connection, a male connection. They'd be screwed in as you go down hole. Uh, always counterclockwise to tighten, so clockwise to tighten, counterclockwise to untighten. And you don't do that in the hole. You do it only once it's above the borehole and locked at the above the borehole or, or above the ground surface when you actually pull them apart. We talked about tricone bits, so that's exactly what this is. Tricone, because there's three of them. Cone, because they're conical. Um, there's an axis along the length, length of this, pushed at the base of the hole, and the drill string is rotated. And as it rotates, you can imagine these little wheels running along the bottom of the hole, just like pastry cutters. I'm not sure why I'm thinking of all these uh, cooking anal analogies today. Cookie cutters, pastry cutters. But uh, if you if you, you know, if you have a decorative edge to a cake, you run this thing along. It just runs along the pastry, and that's exactly what these do. So they don't cut against a static surface. They just roll around on the base of the the borehole. And in doing this, if you're pushing down hard enough on it, the button cutters on here put a very big force on a very small area, and it pops little fragments of the rock off. Uh, the drill fluid is washed down through this central annulus, flows across this, and then goes back along the, the drill hole as it goes up here. I think the same picture. Um, yeah, a driller. Have to learn how to smoke if you're going to work on these rigs. Again, drilling into, I'm not sure, pipe, etc., very similar. This is interesting. This is actually, I don't know if this is still used in the UK. This isn't the UK. This happens to be in China, in uh, Jinan, if that means anything to you, in Shandong province. Same kind of idea. I think it's actually a cable tool rig. Um, this is just a tripod, a three-legged tripod that hangs a mast, and the drilling occurs down by raising and lower things under self-weight, which are raised and lowered using a winch and physically banged into the ground to both drill uh, and advance and to also take samples. It's an interesting thing I saw one day. Oh, we've got five more minutes. I know you're getting antsy to go. If you need to go, then go. I'm going to work through to another five minutes. Uh, this is a water tank that's where the drill rig's pulled off a hole. This is in western Alberta. This is the drill hole with a piezometer left in it. Uh, the water washes back up through the drill hole into this bath. There's a, a grate here, which is just a sieve the suction pump to be able to reintroduce the water back into the drill hole draws from here so immediately it samples the crappy water with the drill cuttings uh, at least filters it partly and then so you have marginally clean water being introduced down into the drill this happens to be piezometer pipe which is uh, ready to be introduced into the hole a tricone with my then car keys for a Chevy Biscayne as it was perhaps not in focus but you get the rough idea. This is a very old bit about to be thrown out. I guess it doesn't like it when you make them big and then you try and advance. Same deal. Uh, in this case, this is a, a tracked rig on a Nodwell for working on permafrost in the north. This is all reclaimed coal mine. This is probably Jasper National Park in the, in the background, by the looks of it. Uh, same kind of rig with uh, hollow stem auger. Same process. Attached to a turnbuckle, it turns around. Physically, you screw it into the ground. This one has been pulled out of the hole with the clumps of soil still attached. This is the hole which has a um, piezometer left in it, grouted in place. This is, again, is this monkey hammer, which is 
raised up into the rig and then dropped down multiple times on the, on the rig. This is piezometer tubing in the rig. It was transported there. This is that Nodwell rig with the turntable. The drill pipe goes through there. These little handles are on pieces of wedges that get pulled out. Uh, when you pull the drill string up to, to pull out of the hole, you pull it up as high as into the mast as you can. You put in these little wedges. You drop this drill steel in. And because the drill steel has a kind of a collar on it as it goes into the thread, then it rests on this now smaller hole. Once it rests on that hole, you can hold it there. You break the pipe with uh, wrenches. You've undone the pipe. You separate it, you take this extra length off, you lay it down on the truck, you pull the, the turntable down to the bottom, you attach it, you raise another length with all the attached lengths below up into the, into the mast and just continue. Same deal, now with the, uh, the mast down, again in Alberta. The guy's working. These bicycle chain things here are to physically drag the, the turntable and push it down with new drill streel existing here. Here's the return supply for the water, the mud supply, back into the mast and then down and then coming into this water bath here. Uh, yeah, it's, it's an auger rig, it's hollow stem auger rig. The same rig, uh, bags of cement. Two more minutes. Yeah, you see this little connection here that locks the drill pipe in place. And in this case, same place, actually it's a different lease next door, but drill pipe being uh, used, and this is just being drilled with air. Much faster to drill with air. You don't need to set up anything on the ground. You just use the compressor to pump air, not even foam in this case, but probably a good way to get silicosis, I'd imagine, in this case. This is drilling through um, shales, shallow shales, uh, with the dust that comes off there. And you drill whichever way you can. This is actually using a rotary drill, actually in an underground research lab in um, France, in the south of France, in shales, experimental lab in shales, to be able to look at the behavior of shales. And this is the turntable here. Uh, air going down through here and down to the bottom of the drill string. And this uh, cap here just being an extractor so that you don't fill the whole of the underground, add it up with um, dust that comes from this, this drill. That's it. So, that's it. so I'll leave it at that. So the bottom line is we want to figure out what's in the subsurface. Direct investigation is one way to do this. Drilling is really, or direct investigation is the euphemism, if you like, for drilling. And drilling comes in different forms depending on you, whether you're dealing with soil, soil and rock, or rock, and the quality or continuity of the sampling that you want to get out of it, always with trade-offs between the cost and the quality of the sampling and the, the surety of exactly what's out there that you want to understand. So what we'll talk about next time is how we sample uh, and how we do continuous um, profiling as other methods of utilizing direct investigations. And then we'll talk about uh, indirect investigations through geophysics, borehole geophysics borehole and surface geophysics. Okay? So I'll stop there. Thanks so much.